so um, today I wanted to talk about software licenses, um, licensing data, and then a bit at the end about human subjects data. You know, so the a central theme of the course has been uh, reproducibility of research, uh, that you can assemble the data and code in a way that you can hand it to someone else, have them rerun the code and get the same figures and tables. But to, to hand the code to someone else and have them rerun it, you need to explicitly um, give them permission to do so. Um, and any really any code that you want other people to use, you, it's a good idea to be explicit about in what way you would like them to be able to use it. And then th that's the, sort of the main topic of the, the lecture today. I know um, a little bit about US law related to, to these matters, but I'm not a lawyer. And so, um, so don't take this as completely the truth. I mean, just as I think much of what we've discussed this semester, you need to like verify for your own needs. Um, what I'm talking about today, I think for sure, you, um, if you want to do something s special, you'll need to do some research and maybe talk to a lawyer. And I'm really focusing just on the U.S. There, the the rules about the rules about um, software intellectual property in other countries can be different, and I'm not familiar enough about um, the differences to really be able to say anything useful at all. But yeah, and and as usual, feel free to stop me and ask questions. Um, you know, click the little guy at the bottom to raise your hand um, and make sure you get my attention. But feel or or you know, type your questions in the chat. If you type the questions in the chat, it'll maintain. Um, it'll it'll still be confidential. I mean, your identity won't be revealed in the subsequent recording that we will post. So central to the the topic today is is this concept of intellectual property. Um, intellectual property is sort of um, property that's not quite the not really a thing, but more of a, a an idea of a thing. So manuscripts and journal articles, books, software, data sets. Um, it's not, you know, the book itself, but the text inside the book. And it's not, um, you know, a printout of the manuscript, but it's the text that's on a printout of a manuscript. But for academics like me, most of what we produce is really intellectual property rather than, you know, actual property. And then the main things that a data scientist or um, an academic statistician or computer scientists will produce are on this list here of, you know, manuscripts and journal articles, books, software, data set, ideas and inventions, laboratory notebooks, instructional materials like, um, you know, the lecture notes and slides for this course, even the syllabus, sort of the main, just the schedule of the course, um, and, you know, websites generally. So we're, I think, all of you in your working life will be producing a lot of these things and um, and that they all constitute intellectual property. The protection of in, your rights intellectual property um, are governed by a variety of different laws and and different kinds of intellectual property are are protected in different ways. So copyright is for um, really text, but music, um, it, it also covers, you know, um, dance performances, videos, uh, websites, copyright, um, patents in rather cover, um, really ideas and inventions. Trademarks, trade dress to cover um, 
to you know protect like a company's name or its logo and another way to another way to protect intellectual property is as a trade secret of just don't tell anybody about it so if you have um, some idea of an algorithm to do something you could um, just never tell anyone how you went about doing it and that would be one way to protect the idea from protect other people from using it um, you know, they, so these things all uh, they differ in in what kinds of intellectual property they cover and they and they they differ in kind of the length that that's in the type of protection that they offer so you know copyright as at this point in the US a very long term so the things that you know the the material that I've produced that's under copyright is protected you know past my death for a whole bunch of years after that um, patents on the other hand have quite short life you know from the time that you've um, obtained the patent it's really only a, a short period of time that you have control over that and it, it will very quickly go to be that it's not protected anymore um, but a main difference a main difference between copyright protection and patent is copyright really is over the the text itself so copyright protection of software is really only of that particular implementation of the software and not really the methods or approach in that's that are taken in the software so copyright over software um, would prevent me from making a copy and and using it myself but wouldn't prevent me from reading it and then totally re-implementing it from scratch patents on the other hand if i if i have a patent on an algorithm um then i can't use the idea in that patent at all unless i get permission of the patent holder so uh, if a, a particular algorithm is has been patented then no one else can use that approach at all in their software even if they came to the idea independently completely um uh, that the there are a lot of complexities in this and it, and you know for example between trademarks and copyright copyright um you can't copyright a single word or a short phrase um you it's really intended for you know longer pieces um, there was recently a a battle over um copyright of that um the dance move by the guy with the backpack um I, I I should perform it at this point, but um, I think you know what I mean. There, the copyright over a short dance move was not allowed because it was um, not a lengthy enough piece for um, copyright to believe to be to cover it. Um, and so, like a you know a phrase like a slogan would not be covered by copyright, but you could instead have it you know trademark it and protect it that way, and that would prevent other people from using a particular phrase, in you know for their business if you've already sort of adopted it. But most of what we're going to talk about today is about is related to copyright. Copyright is automatic as soon as you write something down in the U.S. It's protected under copyright. You don't need to have registered it for it to be protected by copyright. Um, as soon as soon as you type code into a computer, it is protected by copyright. For um, another important concept in um, copyright protection has to do with works for hire. That like if you were, if you were working for a company, say American Family Insurance, and you're writing code. Um, while working for them, you're writing code for them. They typically they would own hold copyright for that software. So if you leave that company, you would not be allowed to um, just take it with you. The, the the employer would would have the copyright of any work that you you produce. That's you know usually the case is when you're doing something that when you're working if you're working for Google. The code that you're writing while you're working for Google is owned by Google and not by you. 
and you need to be very careful. It, I mean, if so, if you're working for a company and you have a hobby that's kind of related to the work that at the company, you need to be pretty careful to to um, protect rights over things that you're doing totally separately outside of your employment, um, so that you really maintain um, the the rights to the work that you're producing. In in academics at, at universities, copyright is um, somewhat different in many cases in that it's customary that that researchers can you know continue to control copyright of the work that they produce so at a university um, you know faculty students staff we're all producing software writing papers writing books producing instructional materials and ordinarily you would think since um, we're you know since we're working for UW Madison, you would think that that would be a work for hire, and UW Madison would own copyright for all that. But in um, um, but at universities, it's generally the case that the researchers continue to control the copyright. That's the 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 standard custom. And at UW Madison, in particular, there's a policy, an explicit policy, that says. Um, except as required by management or other university policies, the university does not claim ownership rights in the intellectual property generated during research by its faculty, staff, or students. So that's really important for you as students that the, you know, the work that you've, you've produced in homework or other projects or you know, all the code that you've written for classes or um, as an employee in a you know in a research assistant position, um, those are generally I mean you maintain ownership of those things. So um, all the you know the websites and course materials that I produce, they're they're I um, keep the copyright to them. There, it does say here, um, you know, except as required by funding agreements or other university policies, um, which is kind of vague and would be hard to, to show. So it, I mean, it can be that you have some funding agreement with a company or with, or a granting agency that makes it so that they have the rights to um, ideas developed in the course of the work. The university policy is the main the main one that to is is related to online teaching. Um, that cor that courses course materials that are being produced for online teaching that involve um, considerable resources from the university. The university um, shares ownership rights or asserts complete ownership rights of that material. Um, Really, so that they, you know, if they hire me to develop an online course, they want to be able to continue to um, show that with, um, without, you know, on their own, use that material. Otherwise, um, and I, I think this particular online course, you know, we've moved this course online. Um, it the, it's believed that I mean the the sort of resources the university provides. For me to do this are so limited that it that that other policy doesn't count, and so I continue to um, own copyright of all the materials I'm producing related to this course. But so, you know, who own? I mean, so things that you create, you own copyright immediately as soon as you create them, um, except in this case where you're where you're doing it for an employer, and then they would own the copyright. And what does that give them? Copyright gives you the exclusive rights to make copies of the work, to distribute or sell the work, to create any derivative works, to perform the work, to display the work publicly. Um, you know, so if the copyright, so I mean, if the, the thing that we're thinking about here is software, um, as soon as I write code, um, to make a software program, I have the exclusive right to make copies of that work. No one else can make a copy of it. 
and I'm the, the sole person that's allowed to distribute it to other people um, to create derivative works. So that means like if it, you can't just grab a function out of my code without having my permission to do so. Um, you can't um, perform the work in, in for software would be actually executing the code. So no one can execute, they can't make a copy of it, they can't execute it without having your permission. You're the only one that's allowed to do it. Um, and to display the work publicly, I guess, you know, like to put it on the web. Um, I guess, so no one else can really do anything with it except that um, what you what you explicitly allow them to do. So as, as soon as you write a paper, you have exclusive rights to it um, unless you, no one else can make a copy or distribute it without your permission. The, the one sort of main um, exclusion on that, those copyright rights are, are is this, this um, concept of fair use that for criticism, criticism or um, or commentary about it, or or teaching or research that is non-commercial, non-profit educational purposes can't. That's not a substantial portion of the work, and that doesn't affect the value of the original work. So you um, people can re, people can reproduce your work if they're they're in a for um, for criticism or commentary or for teaching or research, as long as it satisfies these conditions that it's nonprofit, that it's not the whole thing, um, and that it doesn't somehow affect the value of the work. So question, are, are there typically different agreements around copyright for research with a high potential of being sold to the private sector, such as researchers working on pharmaceuticals? Um, so, I mean, back to, so intellectual, pro, I mean, so this statement at UW-Madison, which is, which is um, typical at universities, even private universities in the U.S., um, that the individuals maintain ownership of the work that they produce in their research. Um, and that would include um, new drugs that they develop. So there, I mean, one, there is another university policy that's, that's important here is that for patenting, um, for, you know, in patenting inventions, they must be done through this one um, organization, the, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation that has to be done through WARF. So faculty or students or staff that are producing um, inventions like pharmaceuticals or, you know, you know, a new way of testing um, for coronavirus, that would need to be, if they want to get a patent, they are required to do it through WARF. And the, um, so WARF would put a lot of effort into um, getting a patent. If they agree that they want to, they will put a lot of effort into it. Um, and then the, the, um, money that comes from that would be shared between the university and the faculty member. And it's, t you know, it's typically shared between WARF and um, the faculty member and the faculty member's department in some way. But, you know, even f um, for, you know, really, you know, big and important, you know, pharmaceutical inventions or, um, other, you know, there, there are a number of important patents at, at the university in, you know, related to, to um, computer, computer chips um, have been related to, you know, you know, drugs and other, and, and like, you know, one of the first patents had to do with trying to get vitamin D into milk was a, a you know, I think what led to the start of WARF, this separate organization at, you know, on the, at the university. 
All right, back to fair use. So one way in which um, other people can reuse your work without getting your permission is if, if you know, in, in uses that count towards this fair use idea. So if I, I mean, so I couldn't um, show a movie um, in class. I, I couldn't show, I couldn't just like play a movie for a bunch of you to, to watch unless it was like in, but unless it was in class, I could show, I could show a movie for educational purposes. As long as it, I mean, and it's not going to somehow affect the value of the original work in some way. Um, or, you know, I couldn't reproduce the, you know, text from a blog um, on my own blog unless I was, was doing so to to write a commentary about it. If I wanted to, you know, this other person had written this work, and I'm going to quote from it and quote small amounts of it that are you know nonprofit and not the whole thing. Then I'm I'm allowed to just do that, and I don't need to get their permission to quote from things if it's for you know the for a critic you know as a critical work. Um, you know, so I reproduce someone's entire paper, but I could reproduce chunks of it if I needed, if I want to do so in order to um, talk about it. And that, so that's fair use. But, and one thing I really want to emphasize here is um, that there's, there's often confusion between um, copyright protection and sort of and failing to follow copyright protection and plagiarism on the other hand. And these, these are really very different things that they have no real relationship to each other at all. That copyright is a, you know, a thing about law and plagiarism is not about law at all. It's a thing about um, sort of academic integrity. So breaking copyright of taking someone's work and copying it when you're not supposed to is a you know a legal thing plagiarism is you know taking their work and pretending like it's your own work um that that um is often not a, a legal problem except if it's breaking copyright but it's still an academic problem even if you have the right to copy something um Acting as if it was was your own work when it's not is um, a, a, a you know a, well a really a different kind of problem and, and sort of also related to that even if you're allowed to make a copy of something you still should cite that original source just as part of our um, sort of academic tradition of um, you know recognize where you're getting ideas. Um, even if you don't, even if legally you don't need to. So with all that prelude, um, we we finally get to software licenses. I guess I'll pause. If, I mean, if you have any other questions, you know, what other questions do you have about copyright? You know, I mean, the the key thing is that copyright covers the the text yeah question when it comes to copyright is it something you have to apply for because before i was a little confused it's it's not necessarily implied is it or do you have to go through some sort of governmental body or as long as your name you are listed as the author it's now copyrighted to you it, just as soon as you as soon as you write it down it's under your protection you don't need to declare copyright, um, and that so that was a change in I think 1986 or so. Before 1986, it was required that you had to um, you had to send a copy of the work to the copyright and I mean office and get and formally register it. Now you copyright that protection is automatic. If you want to take someone to court then you'll need to register it. So you need to, um, so if, if, if you, if I feel like you have, have violated my, my, have, you know, 
taken my work and copied it inappropriately, I would need to really register my ownership, you know, that copyright, have to register copyright before I could take it to court. But I don't really, most, I mean, you, most people won't do that until, un, until it's absolutely necessary. Okay. And then are you going to be talking about authorship through, later or, because then this leads me to the question about authorship, but we can hold off on that for now. I'm happy to talk about authorship, but I wasn't, I think, going to talk about it. So you mean about like who deserves to be an author or not? No. Not necessarily who deserves to be an author, but since you're going to be uh, basically your copyright is kind of passively declared once you show that you're an author on a work or software or something like that. What I guess is there have you ever come across a way or something that we should be aware of to show that our authorship proceeded or was varied enough to make it, a you know, an original work? I guess I'm just curious because, like I say, I want to write a small little script that combines like three people's work, and I author that script, but someone, but you know, I, I give reference or credit to the other scripts. Um, but then someone comes by and you know is trying to tell me that I possibly took their script, or someone wants to use my script and rewrites it, and then uses it. I guess is there a way to kind of secure your authorship? Or do you just have to kind of be on the lookout and be vigilant yourself? Um, I, I mean, I would say that the, it, I mean, it, I, I think, you know, putting something in version control and having, you know, that, version control record that shows when you wrote something and what its state was at different points in time would be kind of the best way to establish that history. But I guess I've never really been in a situation where I would, um, I've seen that as a concern. Um, I think the sort of establishing the, the timing and origin of ideas and that are going to be patented is is more often what's discussed okay where people in that case it's having really careful um documentation in lab notebooks that is that are dated that is usually what people go back and refer to to say i had this idea in you know 2003 well before you did and that you can really show that okay so that's because that's something i learned in my undergrad with doing engineering notebooks i just didn't know if there was so github is a good like way to track that and show timestamps and stuff um are there other digital like notebooks or anything or ways to write critiques or reviews or anything that you use to show timestamps no, not no. I, I mean, I really don't worry about ownership, and and you'll you'll see in a moment. My, um, I'm more about trying to make it clear that what that people can use the work that I create. Okay. I don't, but but that's my own sort of my, that's been my own approach. Let, I mean, let's let I guess let me plunge forward and see if. Um, and, you know, ask me again at the end. Okay, that's fair. So, um, because that, because you own specific, you, because you, as soon as you write software, you have copyright over it. And that means that you are the sole person that's able to, um, copy it or perform it to use it. Um, it's really important for code that you want other people to use, that you're explicit about in what way they can use it. And that's one of the key, um, one, of the, one of the things about software licenses. So software that you distribute to others, you need to explicitly um, assign a license so that it's explicit in what way 
other people can reuse your software. If you don't license your software, then, then formally no one is allowed um, to use your software. A, a software licenses usually have, and they have two main purposes. One is that purpose of be explicit about who can use your software and in what way. And the second part is really to protect yourself against lawsuits um, that in, in many, I mean, and the law here varies by state in the US, but in many states, um, if that software is treated like a good, you know, like a car that you produce. And so if someone were to use your software and, and something went wrong, like if they, they, they used your software and to make some clinical decision, and it led to a mistake and there was a bug in the software say that led to the the wrong clinical decision and some lied as a result of you know some prediction in your software then you could in principle be then sued for that you know mistake you know that mistake down the line a bug in your software that leads to something bad and they'll come back to you and sue you for it um and so, and so that's a, a second clause in your software licenses. Basically, this software is distributed as is, and um, you can't sue me, basically. So software licenses have served two purposes. One is this first one, of just like saying what you can do with your software. And the second one is, is basically to, um, to, to protect yourself against lawsuits due to you know mistakes that occur from running your software, there are hundreds of so different software licenses. I typically choose between the MIT license and the the GNU public license. I'll show those in a in a second, um, and and talk a bit about the difference between them. You should not. I mean, you'll and I'll I'll talk again. I'll talk also about these Creative Commons licenses. Creative Commons licenses, you may have heard of the um, CCBY and C, um, and so forth. Those licenses are really good for, um, for websites and um, publications just to tell people what they can, you know, in what way they can reuse that work. But they're not good for software, mostly because they, um, they don't cover this point of protecting yourself from lawsuits. So you should not use Creative Commons licenses for software. So there are loads of software licenses to choose from. I generally choose between the MIT license and the GPL license. And I'll, so first, the MIT license is what I would prefer to use all the time. It is a very permissive license and what part of what I like about it is that it's it's easy to read. You know, so it has this first clause that's basically saying what people can do with the software. That you are saying people can do whatever they want with it. They can copy it, modify it, merge it with others, publish it, distribute it, whatever, do whatever you want. Um and they and and then a second clause that's basically saying the second thing of don't sue me, that the software is provided as is, no warranty, no matter what happens, I'm not responsible for any damages this software might cause. So the, the MIT license is really permissive in that it's just saying you can do whatever you want with this software, as long as really you continue to show, you know, to mention this and mention me. Um, and don't sue me for it. So I like the MIT license because it's really open and it's easy to read. Like I understand it. The GPL, the GNU public license, um, is um, ha has the same initial clauses of like you can use, modify, distribute, whatever want with the software and you can't hold me liable for any damages it might cause. Um, it has two additional points. One is that um, if you distribute the software, you have to include the source code. You can't just um, distribute compiled versions of the code. 
And secondly, it has this um, um, this clause of software that incorporates this work must also fall under this must also have this same license. Um, the, I mean, so the the MIT license is really simple. It just says do whatever you want with this and don't sue me. The GPL license says, you know, do whatever you want with this, but you must include the source code. And anything that any work that you distribute that includes any of this code, it must also have the same license. So it has this kind of viral um, behavior. Any code that incorporates GPL code must also fall under the GPL. So that I mean the the GNU folks. Um, who were, you know, among the, the, you know, first groups to really um, push for open openness of software. They were concerned about companies coming in and grabbing all their work and using it, but not giving back to the community. And that was what really led to this, you know, software incorporating this work must also have this same license. So if um, Google grabs some idea, some code of mine and incorporates it into its, you know, some new awesome thing that they produce, they need to also um, keep that open to everyone. And they have to be distributing the full source code, not just the source code of the bit that they added. Um, so t for me, I'm, um, my my approach has been basically my approach at this point is code that I can if I can use the MIT license you know just simple do whatever you want with this don't sue me I do I use the MIT license if I need to use the GPL if I've incorporated code from someone else's project that's under a GPL then I will use the GPL um, but that's um, partly that is sort of my I mean, I feel like my role as a as an academic scientist and as a university professor is to help people to, you know, I'm paid a salary and everything else I just want to kind of give away free. Um, and I I've moved towards the just give everything free away free even more over time. So if you use the GPL, um, you you want to include a statement like this on every copy. Um, the actual GPL, you can you know you can read online. It's pretty long. It's like pages long. Um, so you know do whatever you want with this. It's um, don't sue me. Anything that you anything that incorporates this code needs to be distributed with the source code and needs to have the same license. Um, but there are a whole bunch of other complexities that they handle in this license to try to make sure I mean to sort of strengthen it against abuse by by others. Um, I wanted it to really emphasize don't try to create your own license. You know, there are there are hundreds of, of established software licenses. You can um you there's no reason that you should stick with the MIT license or the GPL license the way that I do. There's loads of other ones. Um but don't try don't try to create your own license. You know, sometimes I see people just write, you know, this software is free for academic use for non-commercial purposes. Um, that, that, that's not really sufficient to be a license. Um, for one thing, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't have this clause of protecting you against, uh, um, against damages, which I think is important for software. You want to include that clause. And then it, it doesn't really say, um, it doesn't really say enough about free in what way for anyone else to really know what you're, I mean, th for this to be a really a legal, legally useful statement, I think. Um, 
And, and it's just more complicated. I mean, if, if you just say, I use the MIT license or I use the BSD license or I use the GPL license, then that's something that, um, that everyone else can understand because they're familiar with those licenses. If you create your own license, then it requires really to go to a lawyer and say, what exactly is this, this like newly created license that this person has made? But it still, it's important to pick, pick one, pick a license, any license. Um, this guy, Jeff Atwood, he's got a blog post about this that sort of worth reading. Um, that if you want other people to use your code, you need to be explicit about in what way they can do so. And the way to do that is to explicitly um, ha have an explicit license. And don't try to create your own. There are plenty in the world. Then just pick one of those and go with it. Um, if you really want to do something special, like you want this work to be free for academics, but not free for people outside, you know, companies that are using your software, they should pay. Um, you, you really need to talk to a lawyer to um, get that set up. And I've seen a number of people do this sort of thing. Um, and it's for academic software, it's seldom worthwhile. I think um, it, it ends up requiring a lot of effort and not very much, you don't get very much money back. And more often you're just weakening the, making it harder to, for people to use your software rather than um, making yourself a lot of money from your work. Um, but, you know, if, if, if you see, a, if, you know, if you're interested in doing that, I don't want to, um, really discourage you from trying, but say that the it. My experience has been that even the the best ideas, the best software, um, that this has not been really the the a great way to make um, a commercial success is by this kind of complexity in the licensing of the software. That is probably for for software, it's better to just like make it free um yeah is what i feel the so creative commons was an organization to try to um really promote sharing of of creative materials of um you know text of music of websites um, all, you know, any kind of creative things that, um, and really they, so they created a set of, of licenses that you could use that make it clear, um, that people can reuse your work in certain ways. So one of the declarations is CC zero public domain, where you just say, I declare this work to be in the public domain, do whatever you want. Um, CCBY is you are free to take the work and you know redistribute it, copy it, um, to build upon it, to um, make you know make derivative works. As long, but all those things, as long as you um, continue to you know this attribution of you, you say where you got it from. Um, so that they have this BYSA, the share alike, that's kind of like the DPL, that um, that it, if you if you were to to build upon the work to add it to you know to make a derivative, that it would have to it would have to be released under the same conditions as this one. It would also have to be made CC, you know, attribution and share alike has the same kind of viral clause as the GPL. Um, CCBYND for no derivatives. No derivatives meaning you have to distribute the work exactly as it is. If you see a typo, you can't fix it. You can't incorporate it into a larger work. Um, it has to be distributed just the way it was. Um, you have to, you can distribute it, but you need to attribute it to me and you can't really modify or build upon it in any way. 
the NC clause is is non -critical. Um That you that it can be distributed, but you can't make money off of it. Yeah, so personally, I for for academic kind of materials like course websites um, or um, blogs or or lecture notes or a book that you write, if you want to if you want to distribute that um, for people to just redistribute it, if you want to make it open, I would, I would go, go with, with this this, this um, CCBY. May, or the the CC zero, so I that any that is it's explicit about what people can do, but um, and it, and either you require that people attribute the work to you if they make a copy or they incorporate it into their work, um, or you just say put it in the public domain. The, I mean, academic tradition is such that even if I say something is CC zero, that really, if they're building upon my work, they should they they should attribute me as a source. That they they shouldn't just um, because if they if they were to you know you know copy figures that I made into their slides for their for their course without mentioning that they got it from me, that would count as plagiarism. So it's not really a legal problem, but it would be an academic problem of saying that you made a figure when it was really something you took from someone else. Um, so, and and I'm kind of I've kind of leaned towards just like make it as easy for someone as possible to reuse my work, and not have and assume that they will give me appropriate attribution and not really worry about um, the way in which they do it. And not have not not really require that they um, be too careful about it. I I would I'm would generally discourage folks from using this ND or the NC clause. The ND clause, you know, it has the advantage that no one else. I mean, you're saying no one can really take a figure out of this work and put it into their own. It's really pretty restrictive, and the non-commercial clause. I mean, it, so it it has the advantage that it would protect you from, say, a company grabbing your work and then and then selling it, at, you know, say taking your paper and um, bundling it together with a set of other people's papers and selling it um, for a profit. But the non-commercial clause also kind of looks like it could be a problem for, you know, for educational purposes. Like, um, if someone were to take some of your take some of your work and incorporate it into their own class that they're teaching at a university, really for a salary, that could be viewed as non-commercial. Whether it is or not, whether it is or is not, is not totally clear. Um, and I feel like that. So it, these extra clauses protect you, protect your work from certain, um, you know, parasitic behavior by, you know, by others. But um, it's off. But they also prevent people, you know, good people from using your work in good and useful ways. And I I lean towards just not worrying about the parasitic problems and making things easier for sharing. So this summarizes what I just said on that one slide. So the the BY may be an unnecessary hassle, in that people really need to be um, attributing. You know, if they make use of your work in their own, they just um, they need to be attributing that to you just um, as the usual kind of giving other people act, you know credit academically. But um, but I'm I'm not I'm not against it. 
CCBY for a paper, if you just do that, you know, quite open, you just require people to be, um, to, I mean, you're just requiring attribution and not anything else. It would allow a company to include your work in a book and start making money off of you, off of your work, which you may not like. You know, they're not required to give you any money from that. Um, but this is, I think, not very common. So don't really worry about it too much. Um, I think that no derivatives is really too restrictive. So I, I don't. I don't like it at all. I've seen people use it and I, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like it just seems too restrict to not be able to pull out a, a figure um, seems too much. Um, and this, this NC it's, it's confusing whether or not it could be used within a course, the material that you have. Um, but I, I don't hold it ag against anyone using these extra um, protections, but I avoid them myself. So data, the data that you produce, um, copyright is, is an, the way in which copyright covers data is really unusual in that um, individual data points are generally considered facts and those can't be copyrighted so like um if i measure if i measure a subject's height and weight that those are just considered just facts and so i can't copyright them so if i have a data file that has the height and weight of a bunch of subjects that that is not subject to copyright the, the data itself Compilations of data can be copyrighted. Sort of database that has can be viewed as a creative work of original authorship. It can have copyright protection. So, a, a database or you know an Excel file of my data, you know, arranged in some special way, could or could not. I mean, gen, I mean, it could potentially be copyrighted. Um, but someone could extract the data and reformat it in a different way. And that and that sh would be okay, unless you, I mean, if you if you if so, you had the data were contained in some database, and for anyone to use that database, they had to um, agree to this license that prevents the extracting and redistribu redistribution of the data. Then that would that would um, prevent them from doing this sort of thing of just rearranging the data in a different format. Um, but, you know, generally data sets are not something that's, that are easily, easily protected in the United States because the data itself are considered not a copyrightable thing. And some, some of the law related to this goes back to, um, um, telephone books. There was like, you know, a telephone book that had all the, the names and telephone numbers of everybody in a city and another company would grab that data and make their own book and redis redistribute it. And there was a big, there was a, um, a court case about that, whether that was allowed or not allowed. And it was decided that that was perfectly fine, that you can, that the, the data, the text, the, the phone numbers and names of all the people in a city, that data, those are just facts. And it, in, and that um, compiling them within a telephone book was not sufficiently creative original work for it to be covered by copyright. And I think most of the time data that we have are like that too. But it's kind of a mess, this business of, of to what extent are the data files copyrightable or not. The, the data themselves can't be copyrighted, but the way in which they're compiled could be. But I, so when, and I encourage you to make the data, um, keep that to do what you can to help make data open. So um, I think generally you can redistribute data without a problem, but be sure to cite the original source and cite the relevant papers and generally talk to the, the you know the originator of the data and sort of 
get an agreement with them that that the re redistribution is okay. You know, so a collaborator sends me data, and I want to redistribute it, like as an example. I'm allowed to do that because the data are not copyrighted. Um, but it could really piss off the original person who's like, what have you done? Even though, even though everything I've done is perfectly legal and just, and fine that if I piss them off to some extent, then they might not want to be making data available in the future. So if we want people to be making data available, we want to prevent them from getting all like, um, mad at you for redistributing their data. So before you do it, just ask them for permission, even though, um, even though you really shouldn't have to, I think it's a good idea to do it. And for your own data, I would just declare CC zero public domain, um, just to make it explicit that these data are free for everyone to use. If you want to control data in some way, you want to, you want people to not be redistributing it. Um, the effort to pre protect data is hard. So you really need to talk to a lawyer about how to get um, a proper license. Um, but, you know, so data, the, the kind of data I work with on mouse data, I can, you know, it can be redistributed with no problem. Human subjects data um, cannot just be redistributed. And um, so let's, in turning to the point that, you know, about human subjects research, I say, um, just avoid human subjects research. You know, just kidding. So, I mean, that my, one, you know, my approach has been just like work on mice, then I don't have to worry about um, security of the data in any case. Um, but human human subjects research is is important, and um, so you know I shouldn't I'm I'm not it, so I encourage you to get involved in human subjects research as you wish, um, and and I think it's important to notice that he, if the human if humans are involved in the research they're human subjects. So, you know, stuff that you don't really think about as human subjects research um, is human subjects research. So like surveys or, um, surveys count as human subjects research. And any human subjects research has to be reviewed by an institutional review board, an IRB. Um, so, but, and before you start doing, before you send out a survey, you really need to get IRB, you know, submit a protocol and get it reviewed and get their approval. Not everything counts as research though. This is sort of um, somewhat that data that I'm going to use solely in a course. Like if I'm going to, I give all of you a survey to ask you about, you know, your background in, in, in data science, and then ask you at the end of the class, um, I don't have to get IRB approval on that. Um, you're human subjects, it's a survey, seems like research, but data that I'm using solely for um, sort of internal purposes or solely to illustrate to you as a course, I don't need to get IRB approval to do that. Um, even if like, if, and even if we were, you know, we were all going to, you know, draw and do genetic tests on ourselves and we could look at that data together as a class and that would not really count as research. It could just count as part of the educational process and we wouldn't need to get IRB approval to do that. Um, but what, um, and Really, the 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 main distinction between what they count as research and what they what is not is whether you're going to try to publish a paper about it. If you're going to try to publish on that work, then it's research. So if I do a survey of you, and I use it within a class, that's no problem. If I decide, oh, that was really interesting about like, 
you know, which people, you know, the, the relationship between the people's background and how they ended up doing in the class, if there was some interesting relationship there that I wanted to articulate in a paper, like, no, I can't do that because I needed, I would have needed to have gotten IRB approval to do so. Um, work that you're doing that involves humans, even like a survey, is um, those those people are human subjects, and so that work may need to be reviewed by an IRB. Um, if you're going to use that data just within a class, it's it's okay. But if you want to incorporate it into a text about you know a you know a book or a paper, then it counts as research, and you need to have before you did the survey gotten approval from the IRB. If you if you're working with data that's completely anonymized, um, it may be exempt. If you're working with data that's just um, on people that aren't alive anymore, it could the the work could be exempt. But the, usually the IRB wants to get make the determination about something that's whether the the work is exempt or not. You know, exempt meaning that you don't have to go through, you know, write down a protocol and get a review by the review board. But if you get anonymized data from someone, you could potentially use that and and presented in a paper without getting your own IRB approval on the work. But um, usually you need to talk to the IRB before you can come to that. I mean, and they're the ones that come to that conclusion. And then, you know, a second really important law related to human subjects data is this HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Um, this, it, um, there are special rules about medical data that have any identifying information. So the data for a survey, um, you know, I, I need to get IRB approval to use that, but I'm generally free to like give it to my friends and distribute it without any problem. But if it includes medical information, and it has any identifying information at all, then I have to, then it needs to really be kept private and secure. And I have to, if I, if I distribute it to someone else, I have to really, um, or if there's any chance that it got grabbed by anybody else, um, you know, the, all kinds of forms need to be filled out. I'm not capturing this very well, but um, key thing is really, medical related data that have any identification and that includes zip codes zip codes are considered identifying age or you know dates of test results those sorts of information inside um, the data set then it there's an additional set of rules that govern you know who gets to who gets to use it so even though it you know so if i have um, you know, the data that we use for homework four that has um, various um, risk factors and then whether or not someone has diabetes, that anonymized data is um, would would not be considered human subjects. I mean, it would I mean would not be uh, subject to an IRB approval, really? Well, partly because this is all just within a class. Um, but there's no real HIPAA worry because there's no identifying information in there at all. But if we had a column that was zip code inside that data, then that would be HIPAA data and I couldn't just give it to you. Um, we would need to get lots of permissions to, to decide who can use look at it and who cannot. Um, my, the, the key takeaways here are if you're working with human data, you need to be you need to be careful that you really have permission to be doing the things that you are doing that um, that any you know research with human data needs to get um, approval from an IRB and secondly this HIPAA law makes it that any kind of identifying information within that data adds 
extra layers of security and privacy that need to be ensured and the handling of data that includes these kinds of identifying information that doesn't seem very identifying but really is identifying like zip code then you can't just be passing that around you need to um, be much more careful about it um, but so in summary pick a license any license for software to be reused by someone else they i mean if if they if if you want someone to be able to copy your software and use it you need to make that explicit um i generally i generally pick between the mit or the gpl for software for data i'll say cc0 even though probably is just cc0 automatically anyway i think it's important to cite your sources of software and data um really to do what you can to give credit to the people that you're borrowing things from so that um, they will continue to be making them open. Um, before you start distributing data, you should talk to the source of the data that it's okay. You may not really need to talk to them, but I think it's probably better to, to do so because people aren't aware of um, what you're really allowed to do legally. With human data, you need to be careful to make keep it private and only be distributing it you know where you where you're allowed and if you're not sure about what you can do and what can't you do you need to ask someone for help 